John Knox, Scottish preacher, broken soul, man of God. Who exactly is this man that so drastically changed the land of Scotland? Some call him a heretic. Others called him a saint. Many called him a troublemaker. Maybe he was all of these, or none. As with any man of history, Knox was scarcely as constricted as he seems. In truth, Knox was a man who found strength for reforms in times of great sorrow and weakness. Knox was ordained a priest in the late 1540s in heavily uneducated and corrupt Catholic Scotland. At the time, the writings of Martin Luther were being smuggled into the country, sparking preachers to teach doctrines contrary to the Catholic liturgy. Many of his fellow Scots began preaching salvation through Christ alone. Only a few years after his ordination as a Catholic, Knox came under the influence of George Wishart. Knox, incredibly impressed with the power behind Wishart's preaching, became his bodyguard and defended him with a two-handed broadsword and fierce loyalty. And so, was was John Knox, you know, at the gym every day? I don't know. But there was something about him that was trustworthy, which is probably the, the bigger quality that is necessary for a person in this position that uh, made Knox good candidate to be Wissart's uh, bodyguard. Wissart was under constant danger of arrest or attack. As his fame as a preacher grew, his infamy amongst the Catholics grew as well. He eluded capture several times, but was finally apprehended in 1546 by Cardinal James Beaton. Knox's broadsword had been useless in the end. retribution for the brutal martyrdom of their beloved preacher, several angry Protestants snuck into Beaton's chamber at St. Andrews and brutally stabbed him while he slept. At the outrage at Beaton's death, the now Queen Mary Guise besieged St. Andrews with the aid of the French Catholics in the hopes of suppressing this rebellion. All the wild Knox is inside the castle performing a different duty, teaching. Many said that he had a gift of speaking that rivaled that of even Wishart. It is here that he is finally called upon to preach his very first sermon. His days as a preacher at St Andrews were short-lived, however. With not even a year siege, St Andrews fell to Mary and the French. Knox was imprisoned upon a French ship and forced to labour as a galley slave. was a strong bodyguard and preacher was now a slave captured by the Catholics and imprisoned and chained into demeaning and grueling tasks on his ship. You have to be creative to create this as a form of punishment. This isn't just a you're in a prison. This this is the the sentence of just simply aimlessly rowing you're not able to see anything. It has to be the dankest uh, circumstances that you're in. And this is nonstop. It's relentless. This is all you do, right? I mean, I don't even like to hop on a treadmill for 30 minutes because of that feeling of, where am I going? You know, imagine that as your everyday experience for years. An incident is recorded in his history of the reformation of religion in Scotland the Catholics had presented their Protestant captives with an image of the Virgin Mary and commanded that they give it the kiss of adoration. 
Knox details that one of the prisoners, most likely himself, refused and tossed the image into the River Seine. Even within this grueling time of his life, 19 months he was on this ship. He needed all the strength he could muster to be loyal to Christ. Knox would write of the times when he would see St. Andrew's Castle while sailing past Scotland. He was determined and fully persuaded that he would return to preach there again before he died. At the end of these 19 months, Knox obtained his freedom and was released in England around the year 1549. Knox spent the next five years preaching in England under Edward VI and was welcomed by many in the Church of England. Having again received the call of ministry, he gladly gave himself entirely to the preaching of Christ's gospel. With the untimely death of Edward VI at the age of 15, his half-sister Mary Tudor took the throne. Unlike her father, she was a staunch Catholic and immediately began to persecute the Protestants and reformers in England. Knox is once again forced to leave the islands and flee to the continent. Knox had made his way to Geneva, where he had received lodging and work from none other than fellow reformer John Calvin. Calvin had heard of Knox's plight and was highly impressed with his work in Scotland and his desire to preach the kingdom of God. Knox was highly impressed with Geneva, where he called this school the most perfect school of Christ ever on earth since the apostles. Geneva is this perfect school of Christian character. And so he's committed to take what's going on in Geneva back to Knox and apply what was done for a city to a country. Mm -hmm. Under Calvin's tutelage, Knox learned more of the doctrines of Sola Cristo, Christ alone, and he gained immense respect and love for the old French reformer. In light of the misery of the galleys, Knox benefited immensely from his stay in Geneva as he aided Calvin in preaching to many of the English refugees. Although Mary Tudor continued to reign in exact persecution upon the reformers, Knox returned to his home in 1555 and began preaching openly despite the threat of the Catholics. It's a, it's a Luther line. <clears throat> but I think it applies to Knox. We sing it all the time. I don't think it necessarily connects with us. The body they may kill. Mm -hmm. God's word by the still. I think we sing that. I'm not sure we fully grasp or fully commit, even though we sing it. Yeah. This is an era where, no, that actually is a, an option, that the body may be killed. So... Yeah, that has to give you a sense of urgency to what you do. It has to give you a sense of calling in the deepest sense of that word to what you do. Knox continued in fiery preaching for the next nine months and received no opposition from the still queen regent, Mary Geis. The bishops of Scotland, however, saw his preaching as an effrontery to church authority. Knox was summoned for trial but his favor among many of the nobles caused tremors in the clergy, and they called off the trial. At this time, Knox felt compelled to return to Geneva and continue his ministry with Calvin. Knox began writing a polemic against Mary Tudor, the first blast of the trumpet against the monstrous regiment of women. Many railed against him for these views against women, but one must take into consideration that he had dealt with two nearly tyrannical female monarchs up to this point. The Scottish noble summoned him once again. He took leave of Calvin and Geneva one last time and headed to Scotland. Knox continued to preach the gospel of Christ alone. The nation experienced great revival and conversion. It's, it's probably under Knox's influence, Scotland reached, as historians try to estimate, in the high 90s of literacy, which was a Herculean task mm -hmm. to do in that era. It's hard for us to do in our era for cultures to reach those levels of literacy. It is. 
So this is what Knox was up to, and uh, it was very commendable, all these efforts. At the death of Mary Guise, the nobles came to stand officially with Knox in the Reformation, and they commissioned him to write a confession of faith. So as soon as Knox gets back, he and the five other Johns, I, and I have to find this one of the most ironic things in all of church history, the Scots Confession was written by six people. All six of them were named John. So I just, in my head, I picture this, like, you know, meeting of the John, John, no, not you, the other one. John, no, the other one. Okay, so this is what's happening. And you look at the, you look at the Scots Confession, and it's the theology, it's the worship, it's the nature of church life. It really is everything that Calvin and Geneva embodied. And, you know, keep in mind, Calvin's a generation after Luther. Like this is a solidification of what's going on, not only in Germany, but also in Switzerland and in the sum total of that. Knox is able to bring that in through the Scots Confession. As he grew older and feebler, Knox continued to preach, but with great difficulty. His last sermon he preached on November 9, 1572, at St. Giles in Edinburgh. At his death, Knox commended his soul to Christ, his Savior, as his wife read to him portions of Scripture in the sermons of John Calvin. What of the legacy of this man? Many praised him. Some despised him. All knew that Knox was a man of strength. But his strength came not of himself, but through Christ who gave him the power to preach, defend, and suffer for the faith. In the end, it was Christ who gave him the power.